Welcome to the Startup Grind. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest tonight, Hanson Hosen. Come on up, Hanson. Come on. Thanks, sir. It works. It does. <laughs> that works. It does Thanks work. very much. Thank you. Yeah. It does work. I Every feel way. awake. Yes. <laughs> we, we do that for, so I was telling Hanson, we do that for a couple of reasons. One, because most of our guests deserve it. I say most. Uh, and two... It's always good to just get, add a little energy to the room right before we sit down in our little comfy chairs. Yeah, I do a lot of this on stage stuff, and um, I always see it as a transference of energy between the audience. And we have to compete with every other devices, too, right? Yes, so exactly. you have to make sure that they're tuned <laughs> exactly. in somehow. Totally. Yeah. yeah, the smartphones. Yeah. Compete with the smartphone. So, again, for the people who have not gone to, you know, been to a Stark Brand event, this is really truly a, an interview. It's, it's, uh, it's just two people talking. Uh, you know, we're talking about some of his journey, you know, how does it relate to starting companies, uh, you know, why maybe he made certain decisions, why he didn't make certain decisions. So it really is that, that just really open discussion. And then we'll have a, the last 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, we'll have an open Q&A, so feel free to answer. And we have a, what's cool about here is we have a cool little mic that we can just toss at you. So someone has to catch this thing. This is so cool. I don't know how you guys have seen this yet, but this is really cool. So... Yeah, so you have to ask a question, I can throw that at you. Um, it's a mic, by the way. So yeah, so that's the last 10 or 15 minutes, so hold your questions till the end. Feel free to get up and whine, you're not going to interrupt anything, beer or anything, so, uh, you know, just relax and enjoy yourself. So, Hanson, first of all, thanks for being here. Hey, Mike, thanks for inviting me. Yeah. I think you booked me back in August, I think. Way you really back, planned yeah. far ahead. I try to plan far ahead because it takes a lot of pressure off me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the further ahead I do it, I don't have to worry about it, right? Well, I had five UPS boxes on my front porch today, and they, none of them were stolen, but I do have a camera to keep an eye yes. out on who, yes. who's driving. I just, yeah. Yeah. We, we recommend getting a camera and a package guard, two yeah. things. That's, that's the perfect, the perfect uh, deterrent for, for package theft. Um, well, so, I mean, you've had an extremely interesting background. I mean, this is, you're, you're probably one of the, definitely a, 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 an outlier in our graph of people that we've had on stage. I'm not Russell Wilson, though. No, you're not <laughs> Russell Wilson. Uh, but probably interesting, more interesting story than Russell Wilson, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, tell us just some, you know, you talk about drop the mic, which I really like. You mm -hmm. did a TED talk on that, I think, or some, I mean, I read something about it, and then yeah. uh, I saw a little snippet of, of a, a video. Um, tell us, like, some of the things that why you dropped the mic, and you might, you know, kind of give some context to the group. Well, just to give you a context about this, I gave a, uh, I've given a, a number of TEDx presentations over the last few years, and the most recent one was to or at Oregon State University in front of 1,200 people. And um, I was, I, I, just like this event, I was wondering why on earth I was invited. I mean, like, <laughs> what else, what do I actually have to say? And so I decided, you know, I'm, I'm a former journalist. I used to work for NBC News. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I'm supposed to know what communication is all about. And so I fundamentally always ask myself, not what is my message and who is my audience. My question is always, how can I serve my audience? You know, what do they need right now that I can be of any value to them? And so that talk was thinking, thinking, well, probably the predominant demographic in that audience was going to be millennial, probably recent graduates of college. And the thing that I could probably deliver most to them was some kind of professional advice. You know, what could I tell them that they would not hear from anybody else? And if, uh, just before that, somebody had told me, you know what, just looking at what you do, the thing that you do the most is that you know how to drop the mic. And I had no idea what that meant. I'm quarter of that generation. <laughs> to drop the mic doesn't mean anything to me. So I looked it up and I asked them. They said, no, it means that you're, you know when you're, you're done, you've, you've, you, you can leave on a high point. Point. And I said, you know, that actually really is demonstrative of my professional life. I have, I have shot myself in the foot so many times as a professional in terms of a career. Yeah. And, you know, I, my first job was at NBC News, and my first boss, uh, you're probably all too young for this, but Tom Brokaw, who was the anchor of the NBC Nightly News, was my first boss. And so I did that for three and a half years, and I moved to Israel to be the Middle East producer for NBC. I had an Emmy and an Overseas Press Club award, and I was given stock options. And I quit um, at the height of all that yeah. because it just wasn't meaningful to me it's got, anymore. Got no more, uh, no more juice. No, it's it's just weird because you know all the things on paper made a lot of sense, 
And, and, it was, and I was at the top of the mountain, as I like to say. But I felt like um, the things that I really wanted to do, I wanted to tell really great stories. Um, I felt that the technology that was coming, this was early 2000s, w NBC was not interested in any of this, the digital stuff, smaller cameras, telling different kinds of stories. And they weren't interested in me doing it, despite me being their <laughs> golden boy at the time. So I, I quit. And it was almost kind of a, a spur of the moment quitting thing. And, you know, I felt great for about a day. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, what the hell did I just do? Um, but I, 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 that began, began a pattern for me of this idea that I would do something and explore it with great intellectual curiosity and desire um, because I've, I feel like I'm a, a Wild West kind of person. Yeah. I don't build settlements. I'm the cowboy. Yeah. And because it's meaningful to me. I have a great intellectual curiosity. And when I'm done understanding the system... Um, I'll, I'll start to misbehave within the system, and I know it's time to leave. Yeah. And so that's what's happened. And so whether it's as a, my own, I have my own company, or I'm the director of a graduate program at the University of Washington in communication and digital media, I always know when I've peaked and when it's time to move on before it starts to go downhill. So in the, along those lines of knowing when you peak, right, how do you, how would you coach someone, you know, like, Here's the, here's the two or three clues that you should look for, at least for you personally, and it probably equates to some of us, I would hope, mm -hmm. uh, that, that kind of tells you you're, you're, you're kind of there. Like, yeah. Well, um, I actually, because um, I have a lot of students, they come to me for advice. And my students are multi-generational. Uh, the program I lead at the University of Washington is for professionals. And so... Um, I like to joke that, you know, there's this whole hero's journey that Star Wars is based on, right? And yeah. so, uh, um, and there's this hero who was called to action. So Luke Skywalker's called in to, to do something that he was going to, he wanted to stay on the farm, sure. the robots arrive, and all of a sudden he's got to go off on this, on this thing. So he's a reluctant hero. And so I always thought I was the hero of my own professional story. But along the way in the hero's journey, there's also this old guy who helps you out. He's kind of your mentor or your guide. So think of Gandalf or Dumbledore or Obi-Wan Kenobi. And so uh, I realized very recently that I'm no longer Luke Skywalker in my own, my <laughs> own story. I'm Obi-Wan Kenobi. So my Instagram handle is um, gray beard in a hoodie, uh, which means that that's the role I have to play now. People are coming to me for advice all the time. So yeah. I had the gray beard, no hoodie today. Yeah. Um, and I actually ask two questions always of somebody who's coming to me, whether they're 22 or 42. And it's not about when they're supposed to move on. It's really like, what is their value and who are they supposed to be? And the two questions I ask are really simple. The first one is, if the economy crashed or you lost your job and you just had to make ends meet to just put food on the table till tomorrow, what's the one thing somebody would pay you for? What's the one skill or thing that you have that the outside world recognizes as worth transacting for? Interesting. And so it could be, you know, I'm a great... Uh, I'm great with Photoshop, I can make a video, uh, I'm a really good writer, just really basic stuff, right? And then the second question is, is, is almost the, the inverse. It's, um, all right, when you get home at, at the end of your day, what's the one thing that you just can't help yourself to do and you don't care that you're not getting paid to do it? You know, what's the, so basically, it speaks to your heart, right? Yeah. What is the thing you're most passionate about? You don't, you don't really want the money for it because you just, you'll just do it do anyway. It. Yeah, you do it. And the two never correspond, right? But in an ideal professional situation, yeah. you have both of those things. You can get yeah. paid for the thing that you're really good at and you'll, you can own. And you can do the thing that you're super passionate about that you would do even if they didn't pay you. And so that's what I encourage my students to do. And I always start with a disclaimer. You're going to talk to me and tell me what you're thinking about and all the options you have. And my disclaimer is that I'm always going to choose the riskiest option. And I'm going to give you permission for that. And that's what I did on the, at the TEDx talk, too. A lot of people came up to me after and said, you know, nobody's ever said that I can actually think this way. And so I want people to take, have the, the permission to go do crazy things because it is a thing they would have done if somebody had said it's okay to do that. Because I, I mean, I, was, I, I used to be a war journalist. I used, to, I used to run in one direction when everybody else was running in the <laughs> other direction. You know, I've covered suicide bombings. I spent time in Iraq. I've been to Syria. Um, so, I've been in so earthquakes. So let me it's ask all a question stuff. about that. Because <laughs> this is really interesting. So when you're in that, and I'm, gonna, I'm saying when you're in it, when you're yeah. going towards it, yeah. everybody else is running away from it. It's actually like crossing the 520 bridge in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> in that direction, yeah. So we're, when you're going into that, like, where's your head at? Like, what, what do you, what's in your head? 
Um, that's, uh, uh, first of all, I don't do it anymore, which is why I've suddenly had kids, because of <laughs> the universe said it's okay for you to procreate because you're not going to risk yourself anymore. Yeah. But um, in my head, is it actually is a weird extreme of that intellectual curiosity. I want to see what's going on that is putting people at such an extreme situation. And when I covered stories uh, of war and terrorism and darkness, my, my greatest interest was not in the adrenaline that comes with that, it was actually to find the light in the darkness. So for example, one of my favorite stories that I did um, uh, during the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, I went down to the desert and I hung out with these, um, these Bedouin who were hosting a Jewish family who were, needed help. And so I love those stories. I love the fact, I, I'm looking for hope for humanity when most of it looks so dire and dark. Bleak. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So when you, when, you, when you are in that, let's, let's go back to just that, that situation you talked about. Yeah. And you're there with those people. Yeah. What's your goal? My goal, uh, especially if you're doing television or you got a smartphone with you, my goal is to get people to forget the technology. My goal is for them this. to look at me and forget that I'm even a stranger. My goal is to get them to open their hearts and tell me exactly what's in that heart of theirs. It's the same goal when I'm meeting my students. I want them to feel so in a bubble with me that they're willing to tell me exactly what they're thinking and feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I'm on stage and I have people here, I know when somebody's looking at a device, I don't have to look at them, I can feel it when somebody's distracted and I can tell when people are paying attention to me. Yeah, yeah. That's a really important thing. And that's again the transference of energy that's so important. So equate that to you know, Storytelling tell, story is is paramount when you start a company, in my opinion. Yeah, it's 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 super critical, right? Because you can't tell a tour, if you can't tell your story about the company, where the product exists, then no one's going to remember it. Yeah, it's fundamentally <laughs> it's a narrative about aligning your values with your mission. Yeah, right. And you have to have a really good narrative. Exactly. So when you're when you're coaching someone about storytelling, you know, I c call it storytelling 101, whatever you want to call it, but yeah. Where, what are the things that, what are the pieces, let's just say there's six pieces, what are the pieces, the main pieces they need to have to even tell the story? Well, storytelling um, is fundamentally about transformation. It's about a journey, right? That's why they call it the hero's journey. Yeah. And, and the reason why storytelling works so well, and it sounds so trite because it's become such a buzzword, especially in corporate America, um, <laughs> is that um, storytelling is embedded in our DNA because if you think about what a three-act story, all stories, as Aristotle says, have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, our lives have a beginning, middle, and end as well. Right? And so there's the beginning where we don't know what's going on. There's the middle where we're at the height of our powers. And we all decline in the end, the denouement. And so fundamentally, a story has to be about a status quo or a baseline and some kind of tension or change that comes at us that forces us to transform. And we start the story very differently from the way that we, we, we start, we end the story differently from how we start it. And so when I'm looking at this in the professional context and companies come to me or individuals come to me and say, what is my story or what's, you know, how do I get this out there? I say, well, the best way to do it is to identify that transformation. You know, what are you doing that is going to bring change into the world? I met with, um, I, the University of Washington has an amazing innovation arm where they nurture a lot of startups, and I met with somebody who runs Comotion Labs a couple days ago, and she said the biggest challenge that entrepreneurs have, especially in Seattle right now, is that they're really good with the pitch deck, uh, but they're really bad at actually uh, the bigger narrative that's going to inspire somebody to open their wallets, especially in very conservative Seattle when it comes to money. And she said the biggest thing that somebody can do to convince somebody to do that is to say, I know what the future is going to look like, and mm -hmm. I'm going to make it happen. All right? And you, so you have to convince people both of the credibility of your vision of the future and the fact that you have that transformative technology and the, the tension that's around it is going to change the status quo to something else. And that's fundamentally what a story is about. And we want to be inspired by that, and we want to be part of what that outcome is. Yeah, so, that, I, so, you, so one of the things that, that is probably missing more often than not is that inspiration yeah. I'm assuming, because that's a bit harder. At least, I feel it's a little harder for me when I'm telling a story to inspire. Well, it, well it's, it's missing, too. The inspiration is the outcome. The fundamental thing, and I think where bad movies fail, is motivation. Why, why, does, why does Luke Skywalker, sorry for all this, the nerdy star, star science fiction <laughs> references, but I think it's a good commonality. Uh, why does Luke Sty Skywalker really want to leave the farm to put himself into a situation of danger and uncertainty? 
and if 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 the mo- if you explain that well enough, if you tell me it's because you know his friends have gone off, he wasn't supposed to be there, and then later we learn that he was actually the heir to some dark lord. Sure. Well, that's actually pretty interesting, mm-hmm. and I want to know how this is going to end. That is the essence of good storytelling: is that you have created enough tension. This is what Aristotle talks about. He said it's basically like a winding of a knot. You created enough tension that you've brought the audience along that they want to know how it's going to end. And you can't create that tension if you haven't put together a credible motivation for why that character is doing that. And so when you think about this in the business setting, yeah. um, you want to make sure that the thing that you're trying to build and put out there actually makes sense to the world and, and, that when, and, that, and you're bringing people along for a journey. And when you do deliver that product, it's going to change things for the consumer or whatever else. And so you have to build that credibility and that motivation up front. Yeah, so it's that upfront piece where y- you have your ducks in a row or your facts and figures in, in, in line, whatever you want to call it, yeah. that support the product, right? The, well, the, 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 that's still the very solution tactical. for the problem. I mean, strategically, I mean, if you look at Starbucks, for example, and um, uh, well, I interviewed Howard Schultz, the founder of Starbucks, yeah. a few years ago, and I asked him, he said, you know, when I look at the mission of your company, and I, I, can't, I can't tell you what the mission is, right? You might know the mission off the top of your head. But it's not about, we're going to sell a lot of coffee to make money for shareholders. Sure. That is not the mission. No. Now, they basically, their mission is to create this incredible environment for people to come together and to, 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 to feel and think differently, essentially. It's the third yeah. place, right? Yeah. And, and, and it's, 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 it's to the benefit of their customers, but it's actually to the benefit of their employees. That's highly inspiring. That's motivating. That's a really powerful narrative. Yeah. And it's not tactical. It's big picture, and it's epic. And that's what people want. They want to fall in love with these things, and you have to get them with the story. Yeah, and the story helps them fall. The, the, the story helps them start to it build, feel... It builds, it builds a relationship of credibility, if, if you've seen a great movie the dire- and the director has sort of entertained you and felt you feel good about it, you're more likely to, to watch that director's next movie because they have convinced you that the time you've invested in their narrative is worthwhile. And so it is about credibility f- f- uh, and, and that relationship, a trusted relationship. Yeah. So I wrote a book about five years ago called Storyteller Uprising, Trust and, uh, I forgot the other word, trust and <laughs> persuasion in the digital age. It's like what has happened uh, in the last 30 years is that we've moved away from institutions that have held the keys to the gates around information yeah. to everybody being able to do this, right? Which is great, and it's democratized it, and Donald Trump is president. However, <laughs> um, or is that but? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's another conversation. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but... Um, <laughs> What the challenge is is that because we're all communicating, we don't know who to trust anymore. Yeah. And so if you can actually find a narrative that is powerful enough to convince people that they should tune in to what you have to say, and they want to stay around long enough to see how it's going to end, that's the trust. That's the relationship. So it's not just about creating a great story. It's about, it's actually taking us back thousands of years to, to the traveling minstrels and storytellers in Ireland or wherever else, where you actually are connecting to a community and you're convincing people that you're a credible person to have something that's worth their investing their time in, and you actually might build a longer lasting relationship because of that story. What? How do you, as a, as a founder of a company, that you have a product that you, that no one's, it doesn't exist. It's a, doesn't, the product's never, the, the, the concept of the product just hasn't existed until that day, right? How do you start to educate and tell that story when it's a light bulb? Everyone knows what a light bulb is, yeah. but no one knows what this X is. How do you start to, like... There's no heuristics there. There's no... No, and that's exactly right. Because especially now, um, we're seeing storytelling, communication, professional communication changing before our eyes. Whole marketing departments are being wiped out because we all of a sudden have access to real-time data. Yeah. And my concern about that, um, I understand why, how that's important, and you can actually get, you can make real-time decisions based on how consumers are behaving. The problem is, is that it's still, even if it's instantaneous, it's still in the past. And it's just, it's kind of proving things that have already come. And if you want to be like, say, Steve Jobs and create a market that didn't exist, if, we're gonna, if you're going to rely entirely on data, you're not going to create the next iPod or iPhone. Yeah, because there's no data to it. And so, to me, storytelling is very risk, it's, it's riskier, but it's much more forward-facing than being, be, been focusing on data. And so, what I, tell, what I really advise people to do when they're looking at stories is to think um, as big picture and epically as possible. 
um, it's not about this really small change that you want to make. You fundamentally want to create a change. In fact, the mission statement to my graduate program that I lead, which has got storytelling at its base, is that we are a connected learning community fearlessly tackling challenges to, um, to, to create change using story. And so it's that fearlessness, it's that emotion, it's that it's got to be big enough, it's got to be a mountain big enough to climb that you want to chop down with your product that's going to make people sort of say, yes, I want to be part of that. So it has to be epic. You have to sort of say, not necessarily I want to change the world, which is a cliche, but I want this status quo to go away and I'm going to make it happen with this product that I'm putting out there. And that's the big picture. And then ultimately it's going to be, this is what this product's going to do with you. That's the marketing that comes with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you want to get people in the gate with that kind of big picture thing. Thinking. Yeah, so it's that so that big picture piece is the part that's so hard for people because it's not you don't get taught that. No. That doesn't like <laughs> well maybe in your class but your class is just well, it's, it's, it's fundamentally <laughs> listening. It's, it, yeah. it's amazing. It's, it's exactly what I used to do as a journalist when I'm talking to the Bedouin or I'm dealing with Hezbollah in Lebanon. It's about getting them to forget who uh, they are, who I am, and really tell me what they need. And, and so when I speak to somebody, the, first, the last thing I want to do is tell them who I am and, and, and explain you know, why I'm so important and big to them. It's more like, I really want you to tell me, I want to listen to you. Yeah. I want to know what's motivating you. And when I know that, I can then start applying a little bit of charm and a little bit of, well, what do I have to offer you that's going to make your life a little bit better? Yeah. It's exactly the same thing for storytelling for business. It's like you have to figure out how you're going to serve your audience, your market, your community in a way that they're going to say, this is worth my opening my life up for these people because they're going to make a difference for me. Yeah, so that is, as, a, as a founder, that's, the, that's the, the key to that is, is understanding that, like truly, clearly understanding what people care about. Yeah, and look at your, I mean, your product, for example, That's which you explained to this audience today. Sure. Um, it's, you know, it's a big problem, right? Uh, yeah. People are, lo especially this Christmas, I understood that a lot of packages <laughs> were stolen in front of yeah. people's, yeah. Thing. and so you, you can sort of, you know, I would set the sort of the status quo. It's like, you know, there's more and more thefts ever than ever, you know, Amazon is huge, and everybody's doing online more ordering, more aren't and, yeah. and, and FedEx and UPS are totally stressed out, <laughs> and so they're not even waiting around for signatures anymore, and they're leaving these packages everywhere, and they're being stolen. And it's a crisis. That's, I mean, I'd go as far as saying, this yeah, is a crisis. crisis. <laughs> and people are losing money, and, and, and kids aren't getting their gifts in the holidays. And I have the solution for that. Yeah. I've got this tracker that if you put this thing here, it's going to make everything better. Yeah. And you're going to feel better, and your holidays are going to be saved, and your kids are going to love you again. Yeah. That's how I do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, what I'm hearing, you know, I, I'm, I talk to, you know, lots of entrepreneurs uh, kind of on a monthly basis. And what I... What I don't hear is I don't hear the story. Yeah. Like, there's no story. It's like product features, yeah. which... So, that's so a, and that's especially... Um, <laughs> it's actually... That's endemic to this part of the world, Pacific Northwest. This is a world of engineers and people who really create beautiful technologies, but they do it for, uh, because they're so focused on the technology and the numbers and everything like that. And, we are, and we're a bunch of introverts out here too, right? So we have no social skills. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the challenge is, because especially a lot of these connective technologies, is that the consumers are now expecting to be in some sort of relationship with the product or the company that's doing the product. And so um, what I advocate is that even as these brilliant engineers are creating these amazing products, they should actually always incorporate somebody who gets communication early on in the product development cycle because it's really important that they know how it's going to connect and make people's lives better and that that communication begin now. Yeah. Uh, and you can get iterative with that. I mean, it's kind of like why Google's always in beta, right? They're to hear what the consumer is doing and what they're using it for. Yeah. And so the communication tied to the technology must start from the beginning because that's what people are beginning to expect more and more. Yeah, so, th so how, how, do we, how do we help people... How do we help people better understand that the story is is paramount for uh, especially a new product? I mean, it's, it's I like to, you just can't do it without with a new product. Yeah. How do we help people understand that's important? And one, what can we do to teach them? You know, what are the pillars that we need to kind of put up that say, hey, here's what you have to do. How do we do more of that? Like, I mean, I think um, all of us have to to frankly read more and tune in more to what the world is worrying about and caring about. Um, 
and and you know I was just reading about how all these the the, the, uh, the Wall Street Journal today actually that all these food these um, uh, meals in a kit. Food delivery Startups, companies. Yeah. yeah, they're basically blowing up because nobody's. I mean, it was a great idea, and then everybody started piling on it, and that, and it's not working. Yeah. And so people are thinking, you know, it, it's, it becomes a sort of bandwagon way of thinking about things. And and to me, um, and and I, we are in an interesting time. Uh, this is actually a very pivotal time in human history, and and it's actually part because of some of the people in this room. We have amazing technology happening. It's so I call this the four A's, and I derive it from Thomas Friedman's latest book. Thank you for being late. Uh, yeah. The four A's. First of all, we have a lot of advancements, um, and that's driving in, uh, exponential change, and so we that leads to acceleration. So if you think about the combustion engine that happened in the turn of the last century, um, that led to cars planes, rocket ships, tanks, wars, a lot of things, right? Yeah. That took place over about 80, 100 years. What's happening now with computers and AI and everything else is happening sometimes in, the, in, in months. And so you've got advancements, acceleration, which is the second A. And the third A is the one we're in right now, which is causing so much problems, is that when things change that quickly, we're in a state of constant anxiety. And if you look at what people are talking about on social media or in the media generally, yeah. it's always about, oh my God, I don't know what's going on with Brexit or Donald Trump or with the economics or whatever else. And so what I argue is that communicators and entrepreneurs should all figure out how to lead us to that fourth A, which is um, adapt adaptation. How do we adapt in this, in, in this inflection point, in this time of transformation? How do we actually ease the anxiety um, and how do we yeah. lead to adaptation? So if I'm, as a communicator, which means I want to hear what, peop what, what, what people's pain points are, and I want to sure. ease their pain points. As an entrepreneur, I also want to look at what the troubles and pain points are, and I want to create new products that are going to solve that. And my story will connect to all of that as well. So adaptation out of anxiety is where I see the connection right now. Yeah, so the adapt helping people adapt to all of, the, all of the change that's happening. I mean, it's not like one part of their lives, it's... Several parts of our That's lives. right. Yeah, I mean, uh, a couple of days ago, Mercedes-Benz just opened an R&D office here in Seattle because they wanted the engineering and cloud technology Talent, that's yeah. here, and I went and, and visited because my friend is the principal engineer there. And some of the stuff they're working on is just really interesting, right? It's the self-driving car. It's about how um, it's basically how we they can make our lives better, and you know, especially here in Seattle, where there's terrible traffic. <laughs> um, and, and, and we have problems with climate change and everything like that. And so that's, there's big anxieties around that and transportation generally. And if they can bring solutions to that, then that's, and I would speak that epically from a storytelling point of view, but that's how they should be thinking as well. Like, how do yeah. we solve big problems right now? Yeah. And I, I think one of the things that um, I think Seattle gets a you know, bad rap about is that the entrepreneurs don't swing for the fences enough. Yeah. Like, we're not trying big enough ideas or, you know, we're just not swinging for the fences more. Somebody actually, you know. somebody told me very recently in the last few days that Seattle is too conservative, that um, we kind of just sort of focus on winning ideas. And there's a very small club of, of VC here. So, sure. and that if there's ever a really good idea, they send them immediately down to San Francisco. <laughs> and I'm seeing that happen in Los Angeles yeah. as well. And so we have to change the mix here somehow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree that, that that's a, it's a really interesting point that how we find, you know, and, the, and these kind of events help because we're, you know, we're introducing things, we're talking, we're collaborating, you know, we're learning things. Where is the, I mean, you, what's interesting about what you do and, I, I, you know, I see you on LinkedIn because, you know, we're together on LinkedIn, so I see some of the stuff you're doing and pictures from places you're at. What's really interesting is you, you're in very, very different companies, yeah. industri industries, events. I mean, it's not like you're just doing one thing. You're not in any, like, channel at all. So since you are one of the people that, you know, a few people that have so many influences coming from, you know, different perspectives, what things do you think, does Hanson think that can really help Seattle be, you know, a top three, four city in the way of innovation, you know, I say startups because it's a kind of generalized term, but like, where do you see us? Like, wh what would things would Hanson do? Like, this is what I would do. Yeah. Um, by the way, um, first of all, I'm, LinkedIn is my favorite platform of all the platforms. And I, if anybody here wants to connect to me, just, I'd be happy to accept that. So that's, that's great. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, a few years ago, I was hired by, uh, sort of peripherally by Jeff Bezos to create, he, he gave money to Mohai, the Museum of History and Industry, uh, up by Lake, South Lake yeah. Union to create um, 
an innovation center to basically tell that story. He wanted to tell the next, teach the next generations of people in this region how to be innovators. And so he wants to sort of capture that, that, that uh, lightning in a bottle. And so I ended up interviewing Bezos, and uh, that's how I got Howard Schultz and yeah. a bunch of other really cool, interesting people. people. Yeah. And Bezos never gets interviewed, so I spent an hour and a half with him just talking to him about a lot of this stuff. Uh, and that interview keeps getting bought by other channels to put. What year was that? That was 2013. It's not too long ago. So. No, and he and he st and a lot of the stuff I hear him saying is still exactly what he told me. So yeah. it's okay. <laughs> um, and so um, you know he what he loved about coming. You know, it was a very much a go west young man while he came to Seattle. Yeah. Uh, he he came from New York and he had this idea and he wasn't too sure whether it was going to be New York, uh, Se Seattle, or somewhere else. And he just stopped here. And I think the tax situation here was very 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 much what he liked. But he he likes this idea of this sort of the the kernel of a of a, a complete different creative thought, and then finding people around you who will help you scale it up. And it's just go incessantly at it until you make it sort of perfect. And, and I think that's, that's one, one way of doing it. Um, but I think we need to sort of, I like to position Seattle. I'm on, the, I'm on a number of boards. I'm on the board of the Seattle Chamber of Commerce. I'm on the board of KUW. Um, I believe that Seattle, this part of the world, has a lot to teach the entire planet. I think how we do business from Costco to Starbucks is unique and different, how yeah. we take care of people, how we think about the environment. And so I would like for our story to be the one that sort of leads the change that we need around this planet. And the technology and the companies that come out of here can fuel that. So for example, uh, um, we receive, at my graduate program, we're engaged right now in figuring out how uh, the Japanese government, a Japanese charity gave us some money recently to say, can you figure out how to tell stories differently about ocean health? And so we thought, oh my God, nobody wants to talk about climate change and about you know, orcas dying and salmon going away because that's just too hard and too intractable. And so what we thought is that, well, let's tie it to this region. Let's tie it to the fact that the ocean and salt water is part of our identity. All of our sports teams are named after sure. something that's related to the sea, sure. right? And so what if we, instead of getting into the politics and the science of all this, let's look at how we as people are connected to the ocean, how if the ocean is hurt, it affects our identity. And if we can actually get that right as a technique around story and identity, wouldn't it be great if other parts of the world could sort of take that on and leave the politics out of it, but think about what your relationship is. And so I think fundamentally Seattle is a community-centric, human-centric place, and I would like for us to accelerate that and, and amplify that and come up with solutions here that the rest of the world sees as useful to them as well. So. If, if if you and I, let's just say next week, you and I are starting a company. Yeah. It's, you know, Hanson and Mike Inc. Right. And the you know the the product is it's some consumer product, right? What what are you going to tell? Um, you know, what what pieces would you need to put together the story? Like what what like individual pieces that you need a, you need a thing, you need a thing, you need a thing, and then we can do the story. Yeah. Because I'm trying to give this to, to a founder in, this, in the audience right now. It's like, okay, I got this thing, and I don't know how to tell my story. Yeah. Like, how would we do that? Like, I think there, 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 there are two levels of stories that can be told. The first one is the very personal story, especially of a founder story, I think is really interesting. Yeah. I mean, if you can, if that, and that also gives credibility. Well, what motivated you as a founder to, to think of this thing in the first to place? To do the thing. And tell me a bit of your history about why, you know, what brought you to this point that you thought, because the entrepreneur story is a really interesting one, right? What sort of convinced you that you should throw everything out and not get that day job and give up benefits and possibly jeopardize your family because you think this thing is so important? Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. And, and we should have that origin story because you are a potential superhero, right? If you succeed, you are a superhero. So I want that origin story as all superheroes have. That should be built into it somehow. I think you should personalize it. And then yeah. secondly is, 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 is what I've been saying is that what is going on right now with your world that you think that what you have to offer is so great that it's going to change things. Yeah. So tell me what it is that you're going to do to make that happen and why is there a need for that? And so give me that arc. Give me that three-act yeah. play that tells me what that story is about. It really is a formula. I mean, it really is a formula. It is a formula. Yeah. And, and, it, and it, like I said, it's, it's ingrained in our DNA. It's beginning, middle, and end, and it's about transformation, tension, 
change resolution, right? Yeah. And just think about any movie that you love, unless they're French movies, which are all over the place, or <laughs> Swedish movies, um, that, you know, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, and so we have to think about that because people will relate to that. They'll sort of see, I can relate to that because I could see myself. I can put myself in that person's shoes. That's why some of the best movies work and some of the b- best stories is because um, the character embodies the values of the person you're trying to reach. Yeah, yeah. And so if you can do that with your product, that's even better. Yeah, you've really nailed it. Yeah. If you can get that far. Yeah. Yeah. Which isn't easy. No. No. No, it, it takes a great deal of empathy. It takes a great deal of listening. And then it creates, then you have to stack it properly and pace it. Yeah. And not bore anybody to tears. <laughs> exactly. Like we might be right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, Hanson, where, where, where do you think, um, you know, there, there is a ton of talent in Seattle. I mean, as all H, everyone comes up here and opens offices. I mean, there's a ton of engineering talent in the city. Um, where do you think that being that leader in talent, where, where's that going to lead us as a, as a, as a community? And I, when I say community, I'm talking about like the, the startup kind of ecosystem community where they're, you know, two guys in a garage starting a, you know, company, you know, two women have this great idea to start a new cosmetic. All, what do you think this engineering Vacuum. I mean, it, it, it's truly amazing that every company that needs engineering talent opens an office in Seattle. Yeah. Like, oh, let's go to Seattle. Let's open an office. Mercedes. So what is that going to do? Like, what do you think that can do to the ecosystem here in Seattle? And, like, give me your best uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, that's an that's a interesting one. I, I was actually just going through all the startups that were at the University of Washington. They're incubating through CoMotion and trying to pull out what some of the common themes are. Um, and it's interesting. I think they really are trying to address humanity's most epic challenges right now. And a lot of it's related to health, to finance, um, and a certain degree, I think, to the environment. And so, um, and, and, and we're looking at the use of AR and VR and AI and all the things that people are, you know, all the, the, the headlines right now. <laughs> exactly. Um, Cryptocurrency. And what <laughs> excites me most, this is, this is, this is going to be really big picture stuff and it might, might lose everybody. Um, what we're seeing right now, if I'm right, is the, the de-institution, I, I get this wrong. Basically, we, for the last 300 years, we have lived in the industrial age with the nation state and yep. democratization generally of the world, right? Yep. That's been happening since the Enlightenment. So we're talking about 1700s, 1800s, and then all the things that happened in the 20th century. Um, thanks to a lot of the technologies that have emerged over the last 30 years, which are primarily digital, Um, we are seeing that we can now act at scale, that humans can do things that used to require governments or corporations to get done. Whether you you could, you could do, you used to need that kind of infrastructure, that formalized, legalized, well-capitalized infrastructure to change things, to do big things, to go to war, you know, to build the building, whatever else. And what's happening now, especially with the social technologies propelled by the cloud and the AI and, bit and, and blockchain, is that we're going to see change happening where it's just going to be individuals coming together, made, not even physically, to do great things. And so we don't require those traditional institutions anymore. And we're beginning mm-hmm. to see the cracks already occur. The reason why um, uh, we, we're seeing Brexit and Donald Trump uh, and even some of the foundations of the, the institutions of this country, like the media being attacked or mm-hmm. political parties, is because they're weak. They have been weakening for years, and now they're, they're ripe for a change. And so I think in the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to see a completely different way of how we do business, how we run society, how we think about educating ourselves, because these technologies will be the underpinning of that infrastructure, and it will not require necessarily banks or law firms or laws to, to, to make it happen, to yeah. create that trusted uh, sort of veneer of what is required. What you're kind of describing, like, is that's... that's Blockchain. I mean, what you're a lot of those things you're talking about is blockchain. I think blockchain is. I mean, if we can get the, the servers and everything right, is that blockchain? You know, all for the last three four hundred years, it's been about trust, right? Yeah. Can we create trusted institutions? Can we create myths yes. around a currency or around a constitution that we as a people communally can agree upon? Because we, if we don't have that trust, then we're anarchy and we're a stateless situation. Yeah. But blockchain is actually not a trusted situation, not a trusted platform. It's about trustlessness 
you don't need trust to do because it. it's yeah. verified. It's an auto-verified system. Yeah. And so it's not interesting that we can all of a sudden have currencies and legal systems that don't require a human to verify because we will have faith in the system itself. I was just reading the, Eco I love the Economist magazine and I, I still read it. And every year they do the sort of year end looking way into the future. And there was this amazing article about, a, I think it's a Kickstarter coming out of the Netherlands. You know, we've seen all these bike share things happening sure, and, yeah. and it's horrible, right? You see all these little orange <laughs> and yellow bikes singing all over the place. And, and part, of the cons <laughs> part of the thing is, you know, you, those can be easily stolen and you use your yeah, app, whatever sure. else. But there's a startup in the Netherlands that is actually using blockchain and you can't steal the bike because no one can own the bike. The bike owns itself. This is very Matrix-like, right? Mm -hmm. So the bike owns itself. The bike decides when it's time to get service, you know, because <laughs> it's connected and it's sure. using bl blockchain and all yeah. that other stuff. And that's, that just blows my mind. Yeah. And so that just changes the notion of ownership. It changes the notion of theft. It changes the notion of, of like you can't e steal economics. It's amazing. You can't steal it. No. Because it can't be stolen. It can't be stolen. <laughs> yeah. Because it doesn't own, it doesn't, it's not owned by anyone. No. And that's trustlessness. And that just turns everything upside down if yeah. it works. That's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, questions, guys, you can start in your heads forming questions. I've, I've got plenty of them, but um, feel free to just raise your hand and I'll, I'll grab you. I'll throw the, the pad at you. So I think uh, we're at this really interesting um, point where it's either the brave new world where these new systems are going to come into place and we'll, we'll have a new social contract and people will do business with each other and, and connect each other in very different ways that don't require these foundering institutions, or we're heading to complete chaos and breakdown. Sure. Because we can't get it right. <laughs> um, but, I, but I do think what we're seeing right now politically is endemic of the change that's coming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's really interesting to think about how that, don't that bike is, no one owns it, so you can't no. steal it. No, we can, yeah. yeah no one can it's steal. like there is no spoon. You know, you think yeah. about Matrix, the 1990s movie. Yeah, there is no spoon. There's no, there's no one. <laughs> and why have you, uh, like, what has been the thing that, pushes you to go, like what's, for Hanson, what's the next thing for you? Like what's, what's your next thing you're going to build? Yeah. Or, um, or it's, a movie or film? What are you going to do? No, I'm actually starting, I'm looking to potentially start a new company. Okay. Um, which is looking, basically trying to map where the next technology that will support a new form of storytelling are coming from. I want to look for the women and men in their garages around the world in terms of if, how they're leveraging AI and blockchain and everything else to think about, to think very differently of how we rewire and we re rethread society. Because I think we are, at least here in the United States, I think we're fundamentally broken. Um, I think this is the, the, the social contract broke about 20 years ago. And I want to help sort of rethink how we can reconstitute those bonds, but using a very different paradigm and ideally leveraging technologies that will help that make that happen. So the things I've been talking about for the last 10 minutes is what I'm keenly interested in and yeah. seeing how we can do things differently. That's an, so, so taking some of those ideas and, and experiences obviously you've had, is, is that something you're going to go out and do outreach for uh, other humans in the world and other humans in the U.S. Yeah, What's I mean, your focus because I, I, you know, my, I'm not a, I'm not a, a coder. I'm not even a filmmaker anymore. <laughs> I'm not even. I don't even think I'm a storyteller. I think I, I am a community leader, and people. I mean, you came to me. You know, CEOs come to me. You know, people want to know what they think the answer is going to be for the future and how do we start working on it. Yeah. And so my role is really to start to draw. I, I wanted to, to write the narrative based on the way I see the world going yeah. so that people sort of come on board and we start building it together. We start putting the new constructs in place together that will support this so that my kids will have a healthy environment, the ocean will be clean, and we'll be taking care of each other in different ways that don't necessarily require massive corporate ownership or massive government structures. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what's, is, what is going on with the innovation that Jeff started? What's, what's like, where's it at today? Bezos? Yeah, like the... the what was that? With the, the, the innovation thing at Mohai? Yeah. I mean, I haven't been to it in a few years, I think. I mean, I think his, his message makes complete sense. And obviously, Jeff is now the richest man ever. ever. Mm. <laughs> I posted a picture of me and him on LinkedIn yesterday. And it just, yeah. Well, it, I, I posted something on, the, on mine this morning yeah. about just oh. what you said. Yeah, no, it's, it's crazy. The richest I mean, man ever. What does that tell you? The fact that he's the richest man ever tells you that he built something. I don't think, I, you know, when I, uh, when I spoke to him and I speak to other people at Amazon, I don't think he ever had in his head that this was going to be as big as it was. He said, no, you know, I just want to figure out online 
retail. That's basically, and then it just started, this is the acceleration I'm talking about. He created Amazon Web Services almost as a lark. It was a spin-off because they realized they needed the infrastructure for himself. they were doing, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Prime and then Prime Video, all the stuff. It's just, it's becoming this, this thing much bigger than who he ever was. Yeah. And that's kind of interesting and exciting. I don't know if there's a roadmap anymore for this stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's almost like software and Amazon is going to swallow the world, and I don't think they, they know what's going on. When I speak to people at Microsoft uh, in AI, you know, they're doing great things, and Microsoft has pivoted to being an AI company, but they're also, they don't know what they're building yeah. because this becomes a self-perpetuating machine, and they're a little worried about it too. Yeah. And yeah. so um, I think the, almost the guardrails are off and the wheels are falling off, all this stuff, and we're just sort of hoping we can sort of keep up with it. Yeah, keep the wheels on. Yeah, so I can't up. tell you what's in Jeff Bezos' head. It's, it, I, I, he, but, you know, if anybody wants to know anything, I mean, they probably want to know a bit about him. Sure. Like, we actually had a great conversation, and I know that he can be a, a tough guy. You have to be to create something out of nothing. Uh, but about six months later, I was having uh, dinner with my wife in a restaurant in Fremont, and we were upstairs, and all of a sudden he walks in. And he takes a table about three tables over, <laughs> and uh, everybody's looking at him, and sure. nobody wants to talk to Jeff Bezos. <laughs> and I said, you know, am I, I'm, so I'm just going to go say hi. Yeah. And so I, mean, I, I, I interviewed him. Why exactly. Not? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So I went over to him, and I and this was just after the Fire Phone had come out. Oh. Yeah. And so, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> not a, not a yeah. great hit. <laughs> but I went over and said, hey, Jeff, you may not remember me, but I interviewed you a few months ago at Mohai. And he said, yeah, I totally remember. That was a great interview. And I said, yeah, um, I just wanted to see if you're using a fire phone. <laughs> and so he pulled it out. I said, yeah, totally. And he showed it to me. And, and I thought it was really nice. And then we, his wife came, and they were having dinner. Yeah. And then my wife were having dinner. They finished before they, well, I did. And he came over with his to wife say to say hi and introduce himself to my wife. He didn't have to do that, right? Yeah. And I just thought that was really nice. He also autographed my Kindle. And, and so that'll <laughs> be my, that's my retirement scheme. <laughs> So. I got your Kindle. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, my, my colleague just covered it in, um, in nail polish so it never wears off. <laughs> Howard Schultz also uh, autographed my coffee cup, but my wife put it in the dishwasher and it's half faded. So <laughs> the Kindle is my, my, my retirement policy. That's your retirement policy. Yeah. That's great. Go ahead, Gary. So, Hanson, what's one of the highest... Hold on. Hold on. We got, we got a... Yeah, throw. Oh, we got a mic to throw at you. <laughs> oh, almost. That was pretty good sitting down. <laughs> What's one of the highest highs and the lowest lows of your journalistic career? Yeah, uh, highest high of my journalistic career. Um, that's a that's a really good one. Um, uh, I was. Um, it was actually it, it's it's a small story, but I was once interviewing the mother of a suicide bomber in the Palestinian territories, and. Um, at the time, I was a producer, so we had a reporter who was the one who was supposed to interview her, and she couldn't, she wouldn't say a thing to him. And so I asked him to step outside, and, and I don't speak Arabic, but I sat down with her and I had a translator, and I just sort of looked at her and just took a pause and just started to ask questions in a very different way. And all of a sudden, she started to explain why her son did what he did and what she thought about it. And that was... Um, that was the moment where I realized that what I did was different from what other people did, that I could connect in different pull ways and, and pull that out. And that yeah. was such a, that was a big deal for me. Um, and, I, and I really love that. Um, my lowest low was actually the end of my career in journalism um, when I went to Baghdad for the last time as a journalist and it was so dangerous. Uh, people were getting beheaded. Foreigners were being beheaded. And I didn't find out until I got there that NBC, where I was working, was actually under a very specific fatwa by Al-Qaeda because we'd done something to offend them. And so we had special for ex-British special forces as bodyguards who walked around with massive machine guns. We could only go to go interviews in Baghdad if we were with them in these armored Mercedes. And so it's the exact opposite to the way I like to talk to people, sure. right? I want to be able to walk the streets and find things out and talk to people. And it was just such a non-journalistic situation and I realized then that I never wanted to do this ever again. And so um, that last day I flew out of Baghdad, um, I just said to myself, I don't think I'm ever going to do this. I don't think NBC is ever going to call. And I never did it again, and NBC never called me again. And it was not a bad job, but it almost felt like it was a natural end because yeah. journalism was never going to be the same again, and it is not the same again. I mean, there's still great journalism happening, but it's actually really hard to do good journalism now. So that's, I hope that's a useful answer to you. Great. 
Oh, oh I, I got to throw the thing I out. I keep forgetting I have this in my hand. <laughs> That's part of the fun. Didn't they make this on Shark Tank? I think they sold this. Yeah. Um, so how do you translate a founder's passion for what they're doing and their story to customers and to employees in a scalable way? That's a good question because the two can bifurcate, right? Uh, do employees care about the same things that the <laughs> customers. customers do? Yeah. Um, Hopefully. Yeah. Um, that's a really, really good question and I'd have to think a bit more about it. I, can, I mean, I'm, I'm the director of this graduate program that kind of uh, exploded under my watch and I would like to think that both our students are the customers and my employees, my staff are, are my colleagues and both are extremely motivated and totally bought into the narrative that I put around it that the world is changing. We have the opportunity to be the leaders. The people that we're serving, our students, um, are expecting that to be motivated and they're expecting a level of performance that they don't usually get from higher education. And if we are successful, we will change their lives and we will change the world. And so the students who are coming, um, they are saying, you know, yeah, I, I'm coming to this professional program because so I want to get a good job, but really I buy into this mission statement. I really want to spark change and change the world because I feel like it's going badly. And my colleagues are saying, as employees are saying, I feel really good about being part of that mission to see that change happen. I'm not necessarily the one doing it, but I have bought totally into this mission because I can see the impact that it's having. So I don't know if that answers your question in a universal way, but I think it's fundamentally, um, you know, some, comp some founders and some companies sort of look at employees as their primary constituents and some look at their, their customers. Yeah. And the idea would be that the change you are trying to create is so universal that it can, you can just do a slight variation on the theme and it, it hits both. I wouldn't necessarily say, by the way, that the founder story is always that compelling. I mean, you think about, I can't even think about what the founder story is at Oracle or Sun's Microsystem or anything, even though they have pretty dynamic people, right? Yeah. Um, I think you have to look at the, the fundamentally the, the service that they're, they're offering and how they're different from anybody else and why um, anybody would want to be in an emotional relationship with them and why they think that they what the connection that they're doing is just so big. And when I speak to leader, corporate leaders now in terms of what they're so consumed with, it's partly that they want to still do good business and make lots of money, but because of the way the millennial generation is now entering the workforce, they're deeply concerned about retention and motivating those people. And so they recognize that they have to work equally hard on the, the business mission statement as they do have to, on, on what it takes to, to do those employees. And sometimes the founder uh, can be that story. Uh, ultimately, I think it really is, how, can you f how do you feel like you're making an impact in the world and making it a better place? And I think that resonates especially with younger people. I'd be happy to talk about you this a little bit more when I have time to think about it, but I think that's where I'd start inching. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are two hands there. Well, it's easier than microphone. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you whether you thought that the big corporations and industrial revolution and the stock market, these three conspired together to kill or rather destroy the social contract that originated between the society and people and the society. Because I'm looking at the big companies like Monsanto uh, and like, what is that? Uh, chicken company uh, that they sell, Tyson and yeah. all of the, these people, and the la big industry of cancer, right? One is causing, the other one is curing, and everybody's making money along the way. What is the story that they're saying that people are buying? They don't, a lot of people are not even questioning. So very recently I changed my buying to an organic farm because I really felt this way of going and picking uh, things from a store that does not know about you or don't care about what you eat or anything like that. You know, just what you mentioned. Well, I think it's a really good question. And, and um, you, Wanted to know what your thoughts. It's very easy to blame corporations for this, but it, it actually... I mean, corporations, by the way, haven't existed. They've only existed for about three or 400 years. Yeah. I think the first corporation was created by the King of England or something yeah. like that. So it's a relatively new construct. Um, but what has happened, especially because of deregulation and the courts in the last, say, 30 to 40 years, you know, first of all, we gave human personality to corporations. Basically, they're allowed to do whatever they want because they're, they're, they're individuals. Um, and secondly, um, we deregulated to the extent, you know, we as a society began, especially after World War II, after the horror of World War II, America said, we want to be a leader in the world around values 
that make the world a better place and a cleaner planet and all these other things that we care about that we think would be contagious and that the rest of the world would want to buy into. And, and to support that, we're going to have the regulatory uh, structures and all the sort of societal structures that are going to support that. But what started to happen, especially around the 60s and 70s, is that, um, uh, first of all, we had the culture wars around sure. race and everything else, yeah. and be there began to become pushback. And then the 80s under Reagan and deregulation. I know very specifically in terms of media in the 80s, that's when media went bad. You know, Donald Trump will talk about journalism, lying, whatever else. Um, whether or not that's true, media started to... There is very little trust. Americans have very little trust in the media, and that's part of the social contract breaking. Because in the 80s, Ronald Reagan got rid of the Fairness Doctrine and began to make it very easy for companies to come together to own newspapers and television stations. And all of a sudden, all they cared about was making money as opposed to their mission before. And so what has happened is that we've seen a much greater economic divide over the last 20 or 30 years. We've seen a concentration in corporate power and we've seen also the diminution of governmental and societal power. It's really interesting. I, I love to do this exercise, especially when you watch old television shows. Think about what stadiums and arenas in American cities used to be called. They used to be called Memorial Stadium, or you know, they were yeah. named after the town. Now they're named, you know, Bed Bath and Beyond Stadium. Exactly. They're named after the most powerful. Sponsor, sort of sponsors, sponsors, or ideas. Yeah. Now, the city. Yeah. back then, it was about us coming together to actually create these these community institutions. And now, it's about who's got the money to make it happen because the government certainly doesn't, and communities certainly don't. And so, it's it's not about co corporations making the problem. It's about concentrated power. And so, I actually think um, what's happening with Brexit and Donald Trump is a reaction to that. Some people voted for those things because they wanted to blow up the system. Yeah. They think the system is so corrupt now that we have to actually injure ourselves. It's something like Shiva the Destroyer in Hinduism. <laughs> You've got to destroy something yeah. to build it again. And that's, I think, what's happened. In the middle, the story gets somehow obscured or whatever, so people don't get We the don't have the common... St we don't agree on the story anymore. And if we don't have a common story or a common myth, then we can't support the institutions that we need to be supported and make the investment. And so that's what's under attack right now. And so I think 20 years from now, it will be different. But right now, we're unfortunately living through the pain of what you're describing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. Thank you. Can you throw it all the way over there? That was good. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. So living in the digital age and with extremely limited attention span. <laughs> Seven seconds, I hear. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, we'll say three. There's three parts of the story. How do you communicate that message, initial message, to grab your your target audience online. It can't be a three second video. You see the five second commercials, which everybody's trying to get the message across in three seconds. What's your view on that? And how does the communication of your message online in an um, in one moment, yeah. how is that going to be implemented? I don't, get, I don't get that tactical anymore. In fact, I gave a talk in September. I basically said, you know, the world does not need one more bit of content. They don't need one more film, one more book. They don't, certainly don't need a tweet from you or me. They might need the next or last season of Game of Thrones, and that's it. Right? <laughs> We are just overloaded with this stuff. Yeah. And so you have to sort of go in with the premise is that whatever you have to say, nobody gives a shit what you have to say. Right? Just assume that that's the truth. Just assume that's what's going to happen. And so um, uh, there's a few things to your question. I mean, you can say, you know, use, use vi everybody wants visuals now. T reading's going away. You can do a picture. Instagram's working. That's great. But ultimately, to me, it is continuing to find and listen and find the value proposition to how you're going to serve the person you're trying to reach, that they have no choice but to pay attention to you. That they, what you have to offer, they need so badly because you have listened to them and you've thought about their needs that they are going to tune into what you have to say. And it's kind of a misnomer that our attention span so bad that we only take small bits of things now. We actually are watching more long-form television and video, and people will read long pieces if, if they think there's value to it, yeah, right? Yeah. And so what has changed... Yeah, the attention span is shorter, but we also are looking for value in different ways as well. And we have to fight harder as content creators and communicators to, to earn that, that, that trust and attention. And so, to me, um, I, I, I just don't take any of it for granted. If I'm going to have an event or people are going to listen to me, I have to deliver at so much higher level. 
uh, I, I was mentioning this to somebody recently, that I gave one of the talks I gave, I decided not to use slides. I'm not using slides anymore when I give a talk. Because if people have decided to spend their time here with me, if I can't take another screen out of the equation, if I can't convince them to pay attention to me and not look at their device, yeah. it's not their problem, it's my problem. Yeah. And so I better deliver value. And that's just, that's just the level that we're operating at. So I'm not giving you a, a tactical response, but I'm giving you the state of the nation in terms of what it means to communicate, and you have to think very differently about it. And yeah, the average, vit, average view on Facebook is six seconds, by the way. Thank you. So six seconds is the time. If you can get more than six, then you're doing okay. If you get less, then you're doing bad. But we also have to recognize that we're poisoning ourselves with this. this, this and, and so what I found as well is that actually younger people are beginning to recognize that they want to come together for face-to-face -to -face interaction because they yeah. know that there's something not quite right about having that screen as intermediary. And here's the funny thing, is that the screens that we all care, are, are dis distracting us, this is a transitional technology. You know, all the futurists are looking at what's coming next. We're not going to have cell screens. phones yeah. and screens moving forward. It'll be virtual experiences. It'll be internet of things. It'll be so dissolved into our societal bloodstream that it'll just enhance our experiences in a face-to-face -face situation. It'll be everywhere. That's yeah. right. And so I like to say that, you know, we'll look back on these times when we have our phones with us, like our appendage, as equivalent of... Um, you know, watching a movie from the 90s when the, you know, the CD-ROM was that vital piece of technology <laughs> that people were trying to steal. Yeah, yeah. It's so archaic. Yeah. And this is going to be archaic. Yeah. And hopefully it'll be better. Can you throw that far? Oh, yeah. for sure. Uh, thank you. I have, uh, I have a, a sort of a related question, a related question uh, than previous question. So, um, uh, so I, as you, you guys have already seen, like, there's a lot of people out there um, making money off of YouTube, and they have their own uh, video content, and uh, also a lot of bloggers, they're making money off of, the, of their blogging. So, because uh, you're leading a, a department in UW, and I'm just wondering, have you guys, or any professors and students, have already discussed this, studied this phenomenon, and uh, where do you think this is going? Um, I started. I helped start this phenomenon. <laughs> you know, uh, I, you know it, I, I fun, this is this is about attention migrating from traditional media to online media, and people and advertisers are willing to pay for that attention. So, where is it going? It's um, uh, it's continuing down this road. It's basically it's the death of all, you know it's a death of advertising actually. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, advertising is going to go away. Uh, branded content is you know uh, fundamentally, especially because we're talking about screens going away at some point. Because I really do believe that it's going to be about delivering. Um, uh, transactions. They do this very well in China, by the way. Um, oh, yes. Uh, I agree. That, that, that social media in China um, doesn't necessarily require all these stupid little ads that you see on Facebook and Google. I mean, because they actually do a lot of e-commerce on the equivalent of Twitter and whatever else, right? Because people trust the system. And so I think we're going to see much more transactions happening on these platforms and advertising that supports it may be going away. And we'll be, we'll be in our, our driving car, in our, our self-driving car, uh, a couple of years from now, and we won't be doing anything but consuming content that's sort of holographic or on our windscreen or whatever else, and then along the way we'll be passing a Pagliacci and we'll say, you know, I'm kind of hungry, and, and it'll be aware enough to know not only that not only we don't have to do anything, it'll actually know that we're hungry and we actually could use the pizza, and it'll sort of order it for us along the way, and so that's where we're going. The stuff that you've just described, to me, that's five years ago. Uh, I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about what's coming next, which is predictive, anticipatory, mm -hmm. and not supported by advertising at all. And and, we're, and I want to say this because we're, I think we're looking at two realities. I, where are you from originally? Uh, China. Okay. That's why I'm asking this yeah, question. Yeah, no, I think we're looking at, and this is my greatest fear and my greatest hope, because we're looking at two very different realities, because artificial intelligence is coming, right? And, our, and successful artificial intelligence and all these sort of auto, internet of things and everything else is going to be entirely dependent on really good data sets. And China because it's a surveillance state <laughs> uh, yeah. with people who are sort of locked into these social media platforms yeah. has remarkable data sets. Tons. And they are putting tons of money into artificial intelligence. Meanwhile, here in the United States, we're cutting back on university funding. We're saying we don't want immigrants anymore. We're not willing to talk about artificial intelligence in Congress. And we're sort of surrendering leadership about of another vision of the world that is very American, which is about freedom, creativity, and choice. Yeah. And we're surrendering it potentially 
eventually to this rising empire that's going to lock us into systems that we will not be able to get out of. Uh, and so my greatest concern right now is that we're not being innovative enough here in America to resist the stuff that we're going to be forced to consume in China. If China is better at self-driving cars and all these other things, we'll probably end up buying and using that technology. Absolutely. We'll be locked into yeah. a non-democratic way of doing things. Absolutely. And that's my greatest concern, especially with artificial intelligence. Just like America created rock and roll and Hollywood and pop culture and change the 20th century, China will bring the technologies that we'll all be using in the 21st century, and I don't think it's going to be for the better. Yeah. Interesting. I, and I hope I didn't insult your country. No, but I no. Think, I think it, I'm actually I'm American. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm American now. I used to yeah. be Chinese, so it's okay. Yeah, but that's so my greatest I concern. Really I think we really have to get very smart about the next generation of technologies, and we as humans have to ask very serious questions of this and, and get control of it before it gets, controls us. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, because technology is going to win. Yeah. The, the technology is going to win. Well, did you hear the story about how artificial intelligence you've got computers basically coming up with new languages that humans don't understand? Yeah. You know, and so if AI is doing that, how the hell do we control it? You can't pull the plug on it, right? <laughs> Maybe yeah. we can. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Any other questions? We've got one time for one more. Go ahead. over here. Go ahead. Is that me for watching? Yeah, yeah, that's you. Watch out for the mic, uh, the camera. Uh, nice. It's actually a, it's actually carrying on on that last one. Mm -hmm. So I connect with a lot of what you're saying about the current way that we con that we organize our society is going by the wayside. I also read Thomas Friedman's book, mm -hmm. um, and I feel like and I agree with everything you just said, and I also agree with everything you just said about. Uh, Whoever is able to make it to the game first and most successfully, they're the ones who's going to take the cake. But what you just said about China beating America is at odds with we're no longer going to need that nation. That nation state will no longer be strong enough to make the borders. Yeah. So how do the two reconcile and how do you have... Well, well that's a good question because China is fundamentally about preserving... I mean, the Chinese government is fundamentally about preserving the party and the nation state. And and uh, I don't know if you heard, um, they're, the, they're developing this social credit system that essentially, you know, our reputations on social media media matter to a certain degree, right? If, even if you look at comments in media, people who have more check marks behind their name are more sure. likely to be paid attention to. But what, you know, what they've been talking about in China is that you know, if you behave well on social media, if you don't criticize the government, you might have access to more services. Right? Really? It's kind of like a credit rating sure. but for how we behave. Right? And all of a sudden, the government can totally social engineer all the things that they want to preserve the government and preserve the sanctity of the nation state. And so what that is, what the, the, I, my view, I mean, I'm, I'm still really early on this, but I think the Chinese view of technology is lock in. It's locked in to certainly to serve the state and serve the machinery. The American view or the Western view should be about communities and networks and, and the sense of possible and openness. That is our view of the world. Yeah. And so that's where the nation state begins to dissolve. Now that said, the, I've, I read even this last week that the Chinese, uh, some Chinese are beginning to sort of push back against this control over their social media. And so what my fervent hope is, is that the government doesn't get away with all this and that the people rise up and recognize that there's only so far they're willing to take this. Um, because that's the greatest concern it, it, is that these technologies make the people less dependent on traditional power structures such as yeah. governments and parties yeah. and things like that. Yeah. And China is nothing but a party and a government. <laughs> yeah. Very centralized. Yeah. yeah. Um, There's one other question here. Abhishek. Thank Firstly, thanks for coming up here. Oh, thanks for staying. And I think you <laughs> sponsored too, right? <laughs> and uh, also, I have a question. Like, as you were telling about the storytelling, how to do uh, storytelling in one line, or when we have to give a one-minute storytelling? Yeah. What would you say? The I key mean, point Twitter is that? a really good, some people do it really well on Twitter. And there's this wonderful cliche about uh, Hemingway telling a story in one line. It was a, um, it was a, it was a classified ad. It was. Um, <laughs> um, Baby shoes for sale, free, never used, right? It's something, it's something like that, right? Yeah. And that's like a, like that's one line, right? And you, I heard somebody say, "Ah, oh, you can sort of get the emotions of that, right? That somebody had baby shoes that they wanted to give away, yeah. and they were never used, and you can imagine why they were never used." Yeah, that's, that's a great story. Yeah, it's a sad story but it hits you. And so it's entirely possible to do it in one line. And the, and the way to do it is to sort of, first of all, create the world for me. Set me the status quo. You know, tell me that Harry Potter is living under the stairs because he's an orphan. And then tell me something is something else. Oh, he's got magical powers and he can do something. 
and then tell me where it's going to lead me. And so with that line I just gave you, it's like you know, you're, you're leading me along and I actually want to hear how that's going to end. So you can do it in one line. You can do it in a mission statement. You can do it in a tweet. Um, but is it effective enough? Sometimes you do need 90 minutes to be able to build enough of a world, to build that suspension of disbelief to convince me that I am now totally in the story and I really wanted to see it end. It really depends on the medium. It depends on what you're trying to achieve and it depends on the expectations of the audience. Yeah. That's a great little... There's a, there's a yeah. story. There's a question there and she's one of my former students who can't, so I can... <laughs> Last question. <laughs> yeah, I think she's entitled. Uh, you got to you you catch that, though. Yeah. Might be, give it a good toss. I have a check. So what's the biggest difference in how stories are being told by students now versus when you first joined? Uh, so um, I've been... Uh, and how long ago was that? How so 10 ago? years ago. 10 years ago. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and this is its true with all um, emerging technologies is that we always use the previous primary medium as, as the baseline. And so when radio was invented, everything was a play because theater was sure. the previous thing. Yeah. Right? TV was radio. Yeah, then it went and, we, and now, we, I mean, YouTube has been, even podcasts have sort of been using the TV uh, construct. Oh, sure. Right? With, with breaks and all that stuff. And I think um, uh, that's going to change. I think what's happening, I actually think even this, this narrative, this hero's journey thing might change because if you're looking at virtual reality, if you're looking at artificial intelligence, the experience is almost continuous um, and multi-perspective. And so, you know, movies are very linear. I'm focused on you as a character, but if you have virtual reality, yeah, you or three, you got five other things happening, and you can choose to pay attention to those things. Yeah. So it's multiple storylines. It may be things that don't get resolved. And so, in terms of what our students are looking at now, that's different from say ten years ago. Ten years ago, it was the Wild West, and it was good enough just to be on Facebook and on YouTube because that was cool, and this, and that your success was the fact that you were using it, not that you're, it was actually leading to any outcome. And now the the focus is really because um, you have numbers and you have performance. It's like, okay, if you're going to actually create this video, justify it to me why, and then prove to me that it was worth our investment. Yeah. And so it has become a lot more um, strategic and careful in terms of thinking about content and deliver it because nobody needs more content. And, and VR had a pop a couple of years ago because it was new. And people yeah. were doing VR because they knew they'd get attention. We're not going to get attention about it you know, in a yeah. few years because everyone will be doing it. Doing it. And so I, I think that's what's changed is that we've gotten much more careful about thinking about how to deploy content in different ways and what that context is. So it's not as easy as it used to be. I don't make video anymore, and I used to be a filmmaker. I just find it too hard. And if I'm going to do it, I have better have a really good reason for it. And it better be really good, too. So I'm competing with Game of Thrones, and that guy is making millions of dollars on YouTube. <laughs> exactly. And I suck at both compared to them. <laughs> oh, well, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. It, this has been a wonderful, wonderful time. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, thanks to Clark Newber. Thanks to Abhishek.